Hello, friends. I want to say welcome to Vernonia Church and our online teaching time. I'm so glad you joined us today. My name is Sam. I'm the pastor here at Vernonia Church, and it's my privilege to share with you as we begin a brand new teaching series called The Peace Offer, where we're going to talk about how God offers us a peace that's different than any other peace that we might be able to know. We're going to kick off this teaching series with a message called and offered presence, how he offers his very own presence to bring us peace. And it's going to be a great day. Hey, before we do anything, I want to invite you to pray with me as we ask God to teach us today about his presence and this offer of his presence to teach us how to have true peace that passes understanding, how to have true peace in our life, no matter what's going on around us. Hey, let's pray together. Father in heaven, I pray that you will bless each one joining us here today with an incredible peace. I pray that you will bring peace into our hearts. I pray that we will experience your peace because of the what we do in your word today together, because of the presence of Jesus in our life. God, I pray that you will help us all to experience your peace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said together, amen. Well, let's dive into our teaching and talk about this offered presence. You know, often when I think about the idea of peace, I think of a vacation. Maybe you could think of a vacation that you went on that meant something special to you because of how relaxing it was, how enjoyable it was, how thrilled you were to be wherever you were. I've, I've gone on a few vacations in my life. I haven't gone on a whole lot of them, haven't done a, a, a crazy amount of them, and there's been a few that really meant a lot to me. I don't know what, what your vacation was that meant a lot to you. Maybe you tell us in the, in the comments below. But one of the things that uh, that I think of is sitting on a, a beach on a coast somewhere, looking out over the water in and, and, and that peaceful moment you're there, or going out fishing, or, or, or going out snorkeling and swimming around. And I, I, think of, I think of how in that time on vacation, I, I didn't have the stress of work over my shoulders. I wasn't carrying the burden of, of any struggles. I, I just left them all behind and, and went on vacation and just really enjoyed my vacation. One time our, our, after COVID, our, our church gifted my wife and I a, a vacation, kind of to say thank you for helping us through COVID. And we went on that vacation, and I'm telling you, that was probably the best vacation I ever went on, just because of, of what led up to it. But if you think about the vacation that you went on, and, and you think about the peaceful memory you have on that vacation— I want you to now transition a little bit and think about the time before the vacation. Think about the stress of work. And if I think about that particular vacation for me, I think about the stress of going through COVID and, and trying to make sure our church kept going through COVID, trying to find creative ways to keep us going through COVID. And, and I think about the tireless days and I think about the, the, the stressful days and I think about the frustrating days and I think about the hardship that led up to that vacation and, and, and I think about work and, and it's not a very peaceful thought. And then I think about after the vacation, coming home, trying to catch up on stuff that, you know, was left undone while I was gone and coming home and, and working to try to continue to move the church forward in a post, uh, a post COVID experience and trying to, trying to rebuild. And, and it, and it wasn't a very peaceful thought. And maybe you think of your vacation, you think of the time working to get ready to pay for that vacation, the overtime you had to put in and 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 the stress and the work and the the different things that go on at work or you think about after the vacation and you came home and you got the bill and and and, and you realized how much you were going to have to work after the vacation to pay for the vacation or maybe you worked before the vacation to to save up for the vacation whatever the case was and 
it, and it doesn't really it doesn't really sound peaceful, does it? But here's the thing. Often when we think of the idea of peace, we think of the idea of the absence of something. We think that peace is what happens on vacation. Peace is what happens when there's no stress, no war, no struggle, no, uh, you know, no responsibility. But, but the opposite of peace is everything else when all that's there. Well, here's the thing. The peace that we're talking about isn't a peace that comes from the absence of anything. It's a peace that comes from the presence of God in our life. It's not the absence of struggle, war, turmoil. It's a peace that stays with us in the midst of the struggle, the war, the turmoil, the stress of work, the 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 hardships of life. It's a stress. It's a peace that can be with us even in stress. When God is with us, when God is leading us, he offers us a peace that can go with us wherever we go and and whatever the circumstances are that we're in. King David would say, listen, when God is leading me, he leads me and he gives me peace. Here's how he says it in Psalm 23. He said that when the, that when the Lord leads me, he leads me beside peaceful streams. Now he uses a picture that sounds like a vacation, a peaceful stream and and hanging out. But what he's saying is that God leads me and gives me peace no matter what goes on in my life, no matter what's going on in the world around me. Peace, we're going to discover as we go through this series, is not the absence of anything. Peace is the presence and knowing the presence of God, knowing the presence of Jesus in the midst of everything. He leads me beside peaceful streams. All through the Bible, God will promise us a special kind of peace, a peace that passes understanding, a peace that's with us when it doesn't make sense to be at peace. And and we're going to learn about that peace. I'm going to tell you, I have a lot to learn about that peace. I'm still on this journey where I'm discovering what it means to have peace in the midst of chaos, to have peace in the midst of stress and struggle and and, and in the midst of, of, of just forging forward in this thing called life. But God promises us peace. And here's something that the Bible tells us about God's promises. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, it says this, Because of His glory and His excellence, He has given us great and precious promises. There are Uh, These are the promises that enable you to share in his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. Uh, When you take a hold of God's promise of peace, it will help you as you go through this world. It will help you share in God's divine nature. It will help you as you uh, escape the world's corruption. Uh, This is a powerful a powerful picture of what the promises of God can do in our life. And in Isaiah chapter 54, God tells us that he can give us peace, even in the midst of a world in chaos. In Isaiah chapter 54, verse 10, the prophet will write this, For the mountains may move and the hills may disappear. Now that sounds like chaos. That sounds like volcanoes and and earthquakes and that sounds like that that sounds like a, a world in in turmoil. And so he says, For the mountains may move and the hills may disappear, but even then my faithful love for you will remain. My covenant of blessing, my covenant of peace will never be broken, says the Lord, who has mercy on you. That's how powerful God's promise of peace is for your life. 
that this peace is a peace that you can have when you recognize God is there, even when the mountains disappear, or the mountains move and the hills disappear. God's present God's presence is there no matter what's going on in our world. And so often when we think about the idea of peace, I've come back to it again and talked about vacation. So often when we think about peace, we think about a vacation and how those are the only times we have peace. We think about uh, the absence of noise. We think about the absence of of stress. We think about the absence of struggle. We think about the absence of all kinds of things. And if those things are absent, then we can have peace. What what does a mom say in the middle of of a chaotic home where the kids are, you know, just mommy, 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 or, or, or a mom who's running around all the time. If I could just have quiet, I can have Peace. I remember times where my wife would go to the bathroom and stay in there with the door closed and locked just to have some peace. Well, this peace is a peace that you can have when the kids are crying, mommy, 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 and when there's chaos all around. This is a peace that that isn't about the absence of the noise. This is a peace that's about the presence of Jesus in the midst of the noise. It's not about something missing. It's about something present. And so let's talk about how do we experience this offered presence that gives us peace? I want to just walk through some, some ways to experience God's peace. And the first way is this. The first way to experience God's peace is to, number one, make peace with God. We can't take God's peace and and experience God's peace until we're actually at peace with God. And, And God wants us to be at peace with him. He wants us to have peace with him. And and the apostle Paul will teach us in Romans chapter five, verse one, he will say this, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God Because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. The first way to be at peace is to have peace and to make peace with God. Now, the scriptures teach us that God is our creator. That at creation, God created us to live these live life and be loved by him to live the kind of life that that he created us to live he created us in his image but we're also told at creation that mankind chose not to do the right thing that we chose the wrong thing and even though God created us to do good all of us have fallen short of that good and and all of us have at times done what the bible will call evil and that created this grand separation between us and God. On one side, we know that God is perfect, that God is holy, that God is completely loving, and that God is completely just, both at the same time. And we know that God is perfect. And and then there's over on this side, us. And we are sinful and evil. We don't love people all the time the way we should. We don't love God the way we should. Uh, At times, we're we're sinful, we're broken, and because God is so perfect and holy and good, he can't even be in the presence of sin without pouring out his justice on that sin. And so there's this great gulf between us. There's this there's this animosity between us. And what we needed was for someone who had the ability to bring peace to the picture. Someone to take our hand and to take the hand of the Father and to bring the two hands together. And we know that, that we're powerless to, to, to make that peace on our own because we've already, well, we've already sinned. We've already broken the relationship. 
And we know that only God is powerful enough to bring peace. So God comes in the person of Jesus Christ. God comes in the person of of Jesus to, to bring us together with the Father, to make peace for us. And when we have faith in what Jesus did for us on the cross, when we have faith in his death, his burial, his resurrection, it tells us in Romans that that's what gives us peace with God. In in Colossians chapter 1 verse 20 the apostle Paul will say through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of the blood on the cross. He gives us peace there. I was separated from God because I had done evil. And Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for that evil and and the cross. You see, it wasn't just a place where God showed us his incredible love. It wasn't just a place where God said to us, I forgive you, I love you. Although he does do that there, the cross was a place where Jesus died so that he could make peace between you and God. It was about peace. And if you're here and you're not sure whether or not you're at peace with God, it's time to make peace. It's time to say to Him, you know what? I want to receive the peace that you offer. I want to be at peace with God. I don't know where you're at. Maybe you are at a place where you're more in turmoil. You struggle with the idea of whether you're at peace with God or God's at peace with you. Maybe you think about the things that that you've done, the guilt you have, the grudges you have, the, the struggles you have, and you think, how could I be ever be at peace with God? Well, the beauty of this peace is that Jesus offers it to us all when none of us deserve to be at peace with God. Jesus deserved to be at peace with God. And when he died on the cross, he gave you credit for what he had earned and what he deserved. And he took the credit for the punishment you earned and the animosity that you created. And he says, I want you to be at peace with God. And if you're here, you've never made a first time decision to believe in Jesus and to receive that peace. I just want to encourage you. I want to challenge you to take a hold of that peace. Make a first time decision to believe. Make a decision to have faith. And you might say, well, I don't know if I can have faith. Well, having faith isn't something that just happens. Having faith is something we choose to do. We choose to say, God, I will have faith in you. Kind of like the guy who came to Jesus one time and said, Lord, I believe. I have faith. Help my unbelief. (laughs) He had chosen to have faith and he was asking God to help him fill in all the blanks. (laughs) He He was saying, I believe. It wasn't necessarily a blind belief. We believe because Jesus died, because Jesus rose from the dead, because Jesus fulfilled all kinds of prophecy in Scripture, because Jesus showed that he was risen from the dead and, and he performed miracles after he was risen from the dead and people saw him after he was risen from the dead. And we believe because there's all kinds of evidence that points us towards belief, but ultimately there comes a time and a place where we just have to make the decision to have faith. And if you're in a place where you don't know if you have peace with God, maybe that should be your prayer. God, I believe. I want to make a first time decision to believe. But God, help help my unbelief. Help me fill in the blanks where I lack faith. And God, most of all, I just want to know your presence in my life because, and I want to be at peace with you. I just want to give you an opportunity to make that first-time decision. And maybe you're here and, and, and you've made a first-time decision in the past, but you're at a place where you're struggling. You know, can, can I be at peace with God? And the answer is absolutely. And maybe for you, there just needs to be a, a, a just a, 
rededication of your heart and your life where you say, you know what, God, I have faith and I want this peace too. I want to I want to remind me of this peace. Bring me to back to a place where I can I can know your presence and know this peace. And so maybe you you need to you need to make a decision too and just say I'm going to make Jesus my Lord and and I'm going to be at peace with him. Whatever the case, I, I want to just pause right here in the middle of our teaching and just pray. And I want to encourage you, if you haven't made a first-time decision, to make your first-time decision right now. And I want to encourage you, if you if you're in a place where you need to kind of rededicate yourself to Jesus and take a hold of that faith and that peace, let's do that now. I mean, it's let's actually do it instead of just talk about it, right? And so I want to invite you, just pray with me, Heavenly Father. We come before you right now and. And God, we we ask you to help us know your presence and your peace. We want to be at peace with you. God, sometimes our hearts can get anxious and worried, and sometimes our hearts can get torn away and distracted and sidetracked from our faith in you and our love for you. And God, we want to make a decision. We want to make a decision to claim your promise of peace by our faith. God, there are some here who might be making a first-time decision to believe in you, and I just praise you that you are at work in people's hearts and changing lives. And I pray, Father, uh, that you would forgive us for sinning, forgive us for for turning away from you. Forgive us for the evil in our life and the wickedness and forgive us for the things we have done to hurt others and to hurt ourselves and to hurt you. And God, we just ask that you would bring us the peace of Jesus Christ, that you would help us have faith and more faith. And and God, we believe, help our unbelief. And some of us, God, are here praying and, and we're just We're just asking you to give us once again a reminder of your presence and your peace. And I just pray you would do that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to say thank you for uh, praying that prayer. And and I want to really encourage you, if you prayed today and and you were making a first-time decision, I want to challenge you to let me know about it. There's a place where you could click on the connection cards that you're making a first-time decision to believe. And and if you let me know, I would love to help you and pray for you and just encourage you in your new journey as you're making that kind of decision. But the first place that we will find peace... is finding ourselves in a place where we have peace with God. We can't take a hold of God's promise of peace until we have peace with him. So it begins with making peace with God. And number two is this, after I've made peace with God, I receive God's presence. I start to think about his presence. I receive his presence. And this is a gift that he wants to give to you. He doesn't just want to forgive you, give you promise and hope of heaven. He doesn't just want to do that stuff. What he wants to do is uh, he, he wants to come into your life. He wants to be present in your life. And part of receiving his presence is accepting that it's true, that he's there, that he's with me, that he's in me. I believe, we say in our hearts, in God's peace and his promises, and I receive the gift he gives me, which is his presence in my life. In John chapter 14, verse 27, it says this, uh, Jesus says, I am leaving you a gift. Listen to this, peace of mind and heart. I'm leaving you a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. And what Jesus is saying here, while we're trying hard to get peace, to remove things from our life that are unpeaceful, uh, when we're trying to find ourselves in a place in life with the absence of, of struggle, with the absence of hardship or turmoil, he just offers peace. He says, I'll give you my peace. I'll give you peace of mind and heart, no matter what's going on in your life. 
It's not like a cup that runs out. You know, sometimes we think of peace as a cup that can run out. Oh, don't disturb my peace, you know. Oh, you're you're stealing my peace or you're taking my peace. It, it, we, we go through a tough week maybe and we come to a worship service and we're re-energized, you know. We're, we sing some songs and, and it makes us feel a little better about life and we feel like we're we're filling a cup with a little bit of peace and we hear a message that's encouraging or challenging and live uplifting and, and that cup gets filled up a little more and, and we say hi to a few Christian friends and we go through this process and then we walk out of our worship service as if we have this cup that's filled all the way to the brim and we don't want to spill any. <laughs> and, and then some things start happening and it starts to spill, right? Uh, someone disturbs your peace. Uh, something happens, something comes up, there's an argument in the car on the way home, <laughs> yeah, there's there's a discussion at the dinner table that, that Sunday afternoon, Th- there's a phone call that happens, there's a struggle that happens, and and we we look at the we, we look at peace often as if it's this fight. It's a fight to have peace, to keep peace, to, to, uh, to maintain peace. When Jesus is saying to us, I can give you peace of mind and heart. Even in the midst of this battle. My peace, his peace, isn't dependent. on someone disturbing the peace. His peace can stay, even when people disturb it. His peace can stay. Why? Because it's all based on His presence. His presence in our life. And Jesus tells us here in this little verse what the two greatest enemies to our peace can be. He says this. One, He tells us that when we have a troubled heart, that gets in the way of our peace. And sometimes we can have troubled hearts, can't we? A troubled heart is one that's filled with worry and with anxiety. When the circumstances of my life start to look bigger than God's presence in my life, I can have a troubled heart. And that's the problem. We we forget that Jesus' presence is actually bigger than any of the troubles or problems or struggles we might have. When, when Jesus is present, all of our troubles look small. When we realize who he is, and how big he is, and the peace that he brings by his presence. And when we let our hearts get troubled, well, it leads to less peace. And so he says, don't let your heart be troubled. I have taught you about the gospel. I have taught you about my presence. I have taught you about heaven and hell and forgiveness and grace. And I have taught you all these things. So take my teachings and don't let your heart be troubled. And how do we not let our heart be troubled? Well, we just stop ourselves when we start to feel our hearts be troubled. And we remind our hearts that Jesus' presence is greater than our circumstances. That Jesus' presence is bigger than our circumstances. That Jesus is there in the midst of our circumstances. And so don't let your heart be troubled. And we ask Jesus in the midst of trouble to calm our worries and anxieties. And number two, number two, he says to us, when you have a fearful heart, that gets in the way of peace. Don't let your hearts be troubled or afraid, he says. And fear. We can make a lot of unwise decisions when we're filled with fear, can't we? A lot of the decisions we make in fear or make out of fear actually make our circumstances worse more often than not. And and our circumstances can start to scare us because they start in our minds to look bigger than the presence of Jesus. And Jesus is reminding us here, don't be afraid. And we do a lot of things out of fear. A lot of the sin we commit, we commit because of fear. We we fear we'll miss out on something, so we take it 
when it doesn't belong to us. We, 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 we lie, we steal, we push others away because of fear. We, we stop loving because of fear, fear of being rejected. We, we, we hold on to grudges because of fear, fear that uh, we might be wronged. We, we do all kinds of things in fear. We make unwise and rash decisions in fear, and, and, and we, we avoid hard conversations or real conversations. We avoid struggles that maybe God wants to be with us and take us through because of our fear. We avoid not sharing Christ with others because of fear. And we do a lot of things out of fear. And Jesus said, listen, if you want peace, don't let your hearts be afraid. In fact, all through the scriptures, we'll be taught that there are a lot of things in this world and in this life that we shouldn't be afraid of. And there's only one thing that we should be afraid of. He would tell us, don't be afraid of all the things of the world. Instead, fear God. Fear God. Realize God is bigger than anything else you might be afraid of. And when you realize that you are at peace with Him, and when you realize you have his presence with you, well, what is there to be afraid of? You know, there's this story in Mark chapter 4 where Jesus has been busy with ministry. He'd been traveling and preaching and teaching and performing miracles. His disciples had been with him. And they were out on the, on the Sea of Galilee. They're crossing over so that they could preach in another town. And Jesus was tired. He had fallen asleep. He was wore out. He's taking a nap on the boat. And this storm came up. This storm started raging and the disciples started getting afraid on the boat. Some of them were seasoned uh, captains and seasoned sailors and seasoned fishermen. Uh, They knew the seas and they knew that this storm was a bad one. Well, in their moment of fear, they cried out and they started asking Jesus to do something. Now, I'm not sure what they were asking him to do. Maybe they were asking him to help uh, bail water out. Maybe they were asking him to get up and to, you know, uh, help steer the boat or to get up and do some chore to help them not sink. I have a feeling because of the way they respond at the end of the story, they had no clue what he was going to do. I think they were still gaining faith. They were still at a place where they believed, but they weren't quite sure all the truths about who Jesus was. A lot of the disciples didn't ever really figure out who Jesus was till after his resurrection. And, 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 and in this story, Jesus wakes up, and here's what it says in Mark chapter 4, verse 39. It says, When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind, and he said to the waves, Silence, be still. And suddenly, the wind stopped, and there was a great calm. And I know this wasn't what they expected because they were terrified of him at that moment. Uh, they were uh, they were scared. It says in Mark four forty one, they they asked, "Who is this man? Uh, even the wind and the waves obey him." And here's the thing: I think Jesus performed a lot of the miracles he performed, and we're taught about a lot of the miracles he, he performed because we were meant to learn something from them. I think we were meant to learn lessons from each one in a, in a certain way. I don't think Jesus just performed his miracles showing off. Well, hey, look what I can do. I think he was trying to teach with every moment and every specific thing that he did. And I have a feeling that one of the big lessons in this circumstance was this. When I am with you, you have the presence of God. When I'm with you, you have my promises with you. And, and I, can, I can show you that I'm bigger than any storm that rises up in your life. I am bigger than any circumstance that rises up in your life. And when you have me with you, I can say to your heart, 
be still. Wow. Even in the midst of any crisis or struggle, even in the midst of whatever is going on, I can have peace. And, I, and my heart can be at peace. I, I can say to my heart, don't be troubled. Don't be afraid because Jesus is with me. And, and he's standing up on the boat saying to my heart, be still. Be silent. That's what real peace is. God may not calm the storm of your circumstance, but God will calm the storm in your heart as you go through it. God will be there with you as you go through it. And you know something? The storms of life can come up quickly and suddenly. Whether it's on the Sea of Galilee or on the Pacific Ocean, on the Columbia River, or the Multnomah Channel, the, the storms can come quickly. Ask any fisherman who goes out on a boat. Ask any sea captain who, who goes out, and, and, and they'll tell you that you can go out in what seems like the best of days, and it turns into a storm quickly. I remember a time I was out springer fishing. I have this uh, little... I have this little drift boat that I put a nine horse motor on the back of and I'll go out on big water and I'll fish with it. And I love that little boat and I've done a lot of fishing out of that little boat. And I used to take that little boat over to the Multnomah Channel, which is a, a part of the Willamette River as it goes into the Columbia River. And uh, I would I would fish for Springer salmon, and one day I went out there out by Salvi's Island, and I was putting around. And one thing you got to know when you're in a little boat like that with a little motor like that, all the other bigger boats with bigger motors they they are going. 10 times faster than you, and uh, they are, they're whipping around. I'd be fishing with my little boat going, taking, you know, 10 minutes to do something. And as I'm doing that, I have bigger, faster boats just passing me. And uh, I'm out there on my little guy going, well, one time I was out there, it was calm. It was a beautiful day. And out of nowhere, a storm just kicked up out of nowhere. The I, I felt like you know, you know remember I, I don't know if you remember Gilligan's Island, you know, and and the SS Minnow as it went through the storm and crashed. I was like, oh man, I'm the captain of the SS Minnow out here. This the the waves were so big that my little boat I would go and climb up a climb up a, a a wave and then crash down on the other side, and I couldn't see past the waves. They were that big and. and and I'm, I'm going, man, I got to get out of here. And all the big boats, boom, 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 they were, they were safe and gone. And I'm out there alone in my SS Minnow, going over these big waves. And, and man, by the time I got to the dock and pulled my boat out, my hands were a little shaky. And I'm just going, oh, that was, that was a storm. And you know what? The storms of life can can go like that they can just show up you could be having a good day and then all of a sudden you get in a conversation that doesn't go so well and your day is changed a conversation that doesn't go so well and a, a friendship is changed a conversation that doesn't go so well and a relationship in your family is changed you could be having a great day and get a phone call from a doctor about a report or or have a conversation with a doctor that's really serious and all of a sudden there's a storm a storm it crops up and, and a storm starts up and and here's the thing, <clears throat> Jesus, Jesus' presence, Jesus' presence reminds us that no matter what storm has cropped up, that he can stand and say, peace, be still to our troubled hearts. When we feel ourselves having a troubled heart, when we feel ourselves being afraid, we just remember God's presence. Remember he's there. Remember that 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 no matter what storm crops up, <clears throat> that he he's there with us, that you're never alone. And that thought can give incredible peace. 
And sometimes those storms don't just come one at a time, do they? Sometimes they come over and over and over again. I've heard people, <laughs> I've heard people spread the, uh, uh, what would you call it? I, I think I'd call it a superstition that bad things happen in threes. You ever heard that? And uh, people will say bad things happen in threes. Well, <laughs> it just depends on where you started counting, really. Uh, that's kind of a silly idea uh, to, <laughs> to say because bad things are happening all the time. It just depends on what you're counting and, and when you start counting and when you stop counting, right? Uh, but man, sometimes they can really hit. I remember I was preparing for a mission trip one time. I was getting ready to go on a mission trip. Actually, I don't even remember where I was going, but it was one of the many short-term mission trips I had gone on when I was younger. And I was getting ready to leave, and I got word that my grandpa died. And it was my dad's dad, and so I traveled back to New York, and we went to the 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 funeral and the wake and now now back there back east uh, they have kind of traditions when it comes to funerals that are a little different than over here and in Oregon and here in Oregon a lot of times we'll do uh, just a, a a funeral service and a lot of times people like to call it a celebration of life service uh, I don't whatever you call it it's pretty much the same thing and and that's it. Sometimes, very rarely, there'll be a graveside uh, service too. But back there, back in the east, it kind of turns into an event. You'll have a, a wake, and the wake is where you spend, where the funeral home will open up with an open casket almost for the entire day, where people can come, pay their respects, and see their loved one, and and people will, a family will get together and visit, and and it's just a long day called a wake. And I remember going to the wake for my grandpa, and at the wake, I I had conversation with a lot of my family. I have a big family back there, a lot of family I hadn't seen for a long time. I was catching up with them. And I remember sitting down next to my Aunt Ginny. Now, my Aunt Ginny was my favorite aunt on my dad's side of the family. She was fun. She she was funny. And I loved talking with Ginny. You know, we shared about her faith. We shared about her family and what her kids were up to. And one of them is, is in ministry now, too, like me. And, and uh, we, we just had a great time having a conversation with Aunt Ginny. And then... Uh, we went home and got ready to go to the funeral the next morning. We got word that Aunt Jenny passed away that night. And sometimes, sometimes the storms can come, boom, 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 one after the other. And, and talk about a, a heartbreaking funeral service. You're already there to, to uh, mourn and to kind of say goodbye to someone you cared about only to find out that someone else you cared about was gone that same day. But here's the thing. No matter how many storms crop up, no matter how often the storms crop up, and they will sometimes, Jesus can stand up in the middle of the storm when we remember his presence and he can say to our hearts, don't be troubled or afraid. And I don't know what storm you're in right now. Maybe you don't have one right now. Maybe you do. Maybe you're here right now and, and there's a relationship storm happening in your family uh, or, or you have a relationship storm happening with a friend or with with more than one friend. Maybe you've gone through the storm of a, of a divorce or your parents are going through the storm of divorce and, and maybe you have a struggle with your kids. I don't know what storm it is. Maybe you're in a storm where you don't feel loved. You've been cheated. You've been treated unjustly in some way. And, or maybe you're struggling with a storm of, of anger and angry feelings in your heart. Maybe you're in a storm of grief. You've lost someone you loved. Maybe you're in a storm of loneliness. And you're lonely and you have, you have a sadness. Maybe you're in a storm of failure where you failed and, and you know it was your failure. You messed up and, and you know it and, and you failed. Whether it was at business or at work or in your family, there's this storm. And you want to kick yourself and, and maybe you even struggle with, with hating yourself and your anger comes out and, and it spills over on others. And you're in this storm. Here's the thing. 
Jesus can calm that storm. There's a storm in your heart. A storm of disappointment. A storm of hurt. A, 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 a storm. And as your pastor, I want to tell you, Jesus can calm your storm. He wants to calm your storm. He wants you to have peace with God. And he also wants you to have peace knowing that now that you have peace with God, you have his presence in your life. And he is willing to stand up and say to your heart, peace, silence, be still. It's not that the hurt, the grief, the sorrow ever entirely goes away, but he can come right into the middle of your storm and say, peace, be still. He says, right in the middle of the storm, he wants you to know his presence. And he is bigger than any storm. He's God. He's the sovereign Lord of all. He's bigger than any storm that you might have in your life. And when you realize that he is present with you, wow, there's peace there. I just want to encourage you. Say a little prayer. Jesus, I want to have the gift of your presence and peace in my life. Jesus, would you calm the storm of worry, of anxiety, of fear in my heart. And part of part of receiving the peace that he offers also comes from telling God what you need in the storm. Number number 3 is this. Once I've made peace with God and once I've received his presence, I I tell him what I need in in the middle of this storm. Well, when it comes to knowing God's peace, I, I, I tell God, I, I need you to bring me peace. Kind of like the disciples in the boat in the storm, they said, Jesus, do something. Well, we also come to him and say, Jesus, do something. When it comes to uh, him doing something, the Apostle Paul will teach us in Philippians 4, 6-7, to saying this, Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and and thank him for all he's done. And then you will experience God's peace. Did you hear that? When you don't worry about anything and instead pray about everything, you'll experience his peace. Which extends anything we can understand. Or sorry, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Wouldn't you like that? Wouldn't you like his peace to guard your heart and mind? And if that's going to happen, we need to understand how those two words, anything and everything, looks like, don't we? He says, when it comes to anything, don't worry about anything. You mean anything? Shouldn't I worry about my kids? Shouldn't I worry about work? Shouldn't I worry about my circumstances? No, he says don't worry about anything. Well, what then? Well, here's what he says. When it comes to everything, pray about everything. Don't worry about anything and pray about everything. You start to find yourself in a place of worry, just start praying. Pray about that thing you're worried about. And if you're like me, there are times where you do just the opposite of what he tells us here, this formula for peace. You do just the opposite and wonder why you don't have peace. Here's what I mean. How many of us worry about everything and don't pray about anything? Do you ever find yourself in a place where that's your plan? That's the way you go about things? You just worry about everything and don't pray about anything. 
I'll be honest with you, there are a lot of times where I find myself in that pattern rather than this one. And I wonder, why don't I have peace? Well, you don't have peace because you're worrying about everything and you're not praying about anything. But we need to flip-flop that. And don't worry about anything. Why? Because we know His presence. Why? Because we know He can calm the storm and still my heart and He can protect my heart. And so, instead of worrying about everything. I'm not going to worry about anything, and I'm going to pray about everything. And what I do is it helps to remember His presence. I don't have to worry because He's right there, and He's bigger than my struggle. He's bigger than whatever it is I might worry about. And so I tell Him what I need. God Here's what I need. He tells me, tell me what you need. He tells us to pray about everything we might worry about or everything we might need. It, it starts with just saying, you know, God, I have a need. You're overwhelmed? Tell him what you need. You're struggling? Tell him what you need. You're sad? You're angry? You're lonely? Tell him what you need. You're pulled in too many directions. Tell him what you need. You have worry or anxiety. Tell him <coughs> what you need. And, and we struggle with this sometimes. We struggle because it takes humility to do this, doesn't it? You see, it's prideful when we have too much pride. And we have so much pride that we won't tell God what we need. We, we like to tell God we don't need anything. Because of our pride. And it takes humility to say, God, I'm struggling. God, I'm, I'm lonely. God, I'm overwhelmed. It takes humility. Sometimes that pride tells us, oh, God doesn't want to bother with us and our requests. He's so busy with other people with bigger problems. We think that our problems are too small or we think ourselves unworthy, which we are. We're not worthy. But because of the blood of Christ and because God has made peace with God through Christ for us, it doesn't matter that we're unworthy. Now he calls us his children who are worthy. We struggle with telling him what we need, and, and he says, no, just, just tell me. And prayer is simple. We don't have to complicate it. Prayer is simply just humbly saying to God, God, here's what I need. Like a child who tells his parents what they need, and we tell him as soon as we recognize we need it. You know, there's passages that say you don't have because you don't ask. And sometimes I wonder how many of our struggles and storms and trials have come because we didn't pray at the beginning. We waited until they got so bad that then we prayed. If we just go ahead and pray as soon as we recognize it, as soon as we see it, I, I wonder how often some of our struggles and trials and hardship and, and turmoil could have been avoided if we just prayed ahead of time and said, God, here's what I need. God says that when we turn to him like this for this peace, when we, when we don't worry about anything and pray about it all, that he will guard our hearts. I think of a guard. You know, what does it mean to guard something? Well, it means to protect it. It means that you're going to stop break-ins. It means that you're going to, to stop something that could hurt it. It, it, it. A guard, it, it's something that you put in place before you have a problem, you know, you, it, to avoid a problem. God says, if you tell me what you need, my peace will guard your heart. And one of the things that we should be telling him we need, by the way, is God's peace in our life. One of the things that we're told to pray for is, is God's peace. You want God's peace? Pray for God's peace. Uh, I've my, found myself praying for that a lot. I've been praying, God, will you teach me how to have this peace? Will you show me what it looks like to have a peace that, that stays with you no matter what happens? The last couple of years, God's been teaching me about this peace, and, and he's helped me learn how to have this peace and when was the last time that you prayed for the peace of God in your life? When was the last time you just said, God, 
teach me about your peace. Do you know that one of the most common prayers in the Bible are prayers for peace? In the Old Testament, it's smattered with prayers about peace peace, especially in the Psalms. Peace is an important thing. Even the Hebrew word for peace became the the common greeting in their culture. The reason it's a common greeting is because it's, it's somewhat of a prayer. May God's peace be on you. May God's peace be with you. Almost every letter in the New Testament begins with a prayer for peace and grace. There are, there are more than 20 times where where people pray in the New Testament for God's peace. And it's a reminder for us that among other things we pray for, one of the things we should be praying for is, is this peace of God in our lives and in the lives of others. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 16, it says this, the Apostle Paul prays, Now may the, Lord's, uh, of, may, now may the Lord of peace himself give you his peace at all times and in every situation. You hear that? That this peace is not a peace of absence of situations. This peace comes from his presence in all and every situation. The Lord be with you all, he says. That's where it comes from. It comes from God being with us. And so we pray, God, give me peace at all times and in every circumstance. God, give me peace. So that, and God, I'll let you know what I need. And finally, the, the, last, uh, the last way to experience this peace that comes from his presence is to focus on on God's presence. I focus on God's presence. Well, one of the greatest promises in all of the Bible we find in Isaiah chapter 26, where it says in Isaiah 26, 3, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. You might repeat that one with me. I'm going to read it again at the count of three, and uh, wherever you are, if you're in a place where you can, just say that out loud with me. You ready? You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Now, it's, it's more than just positive thinking, isn't it? It's more than just saying, well, I'll think good thoughts. It, it's thinking God thoughts. It's thinking about His real presence. It's realizing Jesus is present, that He's in th this place right now, wherever you are, He's with you right now. He's with you. Even though you might not see Him, He's there with you. There's nowhere you can go where He's not with you. And he makes us this promise. He will, he will keep in perfect peace those who trust him and who fix their thoughts on him. And thinking about his presence and knowing his presence, well, it brings what he calls perfect peace. You know, one of the promises Jesus made to his disciples was, I will be with you always even to the end of the age. I'll be with you always, he promises us. Another promise he makes is not only will he be with us, but by the presence of the Holy Spirit, he will be in us. And so wherever we go, he's with us and in us. And if we can fix our thoughts on him, that brings perfect peace, no matter what circumstance. And there aren't too many in the things in this world that are perfect, are there? I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. This world's not perfect. Our, our circumstances might not be perfect. But he says, focus your thoughts on me in the midst of an imperfect world, and I will give you perfect peace. You know, Jesus had this perfect peace, and... And it didn't mean that he walked around stoic. 
you know, that's another thing that, that we misunderstand. We think of the idea of peace as the absence of emotions. Well, Jesus was an emotional guy. Jesus was a funny guy. Jesus was a sarcastic guy. Sometimes Jesus was an angry guy. We, we see him as he goes through emotion. Sometimes Jesus uh, was a man of sorrows. In fact, the Bible will tell us that he was a man of sorrows, and yet he had perfect peace in the midst of all that emotion. He was angry with religious leaders. Sometimes he was disappointed with his disciples and and let him know let them know about it. And and and, and as you read the gospels, you can almost at times even feel him being irritated with people. And yet he had perfect peace. All that emotion, and yet there was peace in the midst of it. Jesus had peace and joy even on the cross in the midst of that torturous storm. How? How did he do that? In the midst of that, in the midst of that world that wasn't perfect, he had a perfect peace. And you don't have to wait for the circumstances to be right to have peace. That's that's what we're talking about. Because this peace comes from the presence of God in our lives. He can give you the same peace he had. In the midst of a stressful life, he can do what what he can do. He's God. He can bring peace. He can stand up and say to the wind and waves, silence, be still. And sometimes all it takes is for us to change our focus. We lose faith when we look at the storm around us. We lose faith and focus when we worry, have anxiety, and give in to fear. But he says, no, focus. Focus on the one who's bigger than this world, whose presence is in your life. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, the Apostle Paul says, Let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. Let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. Now, what does a ruler do? Well, a ruler gives commands. A ruler says stop. A ruler lays down the law. A ruler is in charge. And so what Paul is telling us is let the peace that comes from Christ be in charge in your heart. And and what that means is, well, the peace of Christ has the authority to say to my heart when it's filled with worry and anxiety and fear, stop it. You have to come into a play where you say, I'm going to let the peace of Christ tell me to stop it. Stop being afraid. Stop worrying. Stop it. Stop stewing and stop spewing and stop brewing when it comes to the trouble. Stop focusing on all the trouble. Instead, instead focus on the presence of God who is bigger than my trouble. And I can say to my heart, stop it. I'll let the peace of God rule in my heart. In John 16, 33, Jesus says, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you'll have many trials and troubles and sorrows. But take heart, because I have overcome the world. And he's present. He's there. He's overcome this world. This world is on limited time. This world and my life is on limited time. And instead of letting my peace be dependent on the circumstances of the world, I'll let it be dependent on the presence of my Lord my shepherd who leads me 
beside still waters and peaceful streams. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we once again just pray that you will help us to know your peace in our life. We pray that you'll help us to experience your peace. and We pray that we'll be able to focus on your presence no matter what's going on in our life. God, I don't know where everyone is that's joining me here today. There might be some real storms out there. And God, I pray that this teaching will help bring someone to a place. I know it's bringing me to a place to where I just want to focus more on the presence of God. I want to say, Jesus, do something. Stand up in the boat in the storm of my life and make that command. Silence. Be still. Lord, may my heart hear that command. And may I learn to have the peace that passes understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to thank you for joining me in this in this beginning of this teaching series where we're talking about the peace offer, the, the, the peace that, that Jesus wants to offer you and, and me. And, and hopefully you'll learn more about this peace as we go through this series. And it's going to be encouraging and challenging. So I want to invite you to come back next week as we continue this series and thinking about this, this amazing peace offer. And so I want to say thanks for being with me. Let's finish up today by declaring it's been a great day together. I love doing this every every time we're together. On the count of three, if you can join me on the count of three, we're going to declare it's been a great day. You ready? One, two, three. It's been a great day. I hope you have a great day and a great week, and I'll see you next Sunday.